So we're going to be talking a lot about inspiration this morning. Um, and uh, I, I wrote this when I was 13. Serenity, come take my hand. Hope, come fill my soul. Dreams, help me find sunshine. Come together, make me whole. With dedication for my purpose, patient shadowed motivation, inspiration, find me. Come fill my aspiration. <laughs> So that's pretty 13-year-old poetry, but <laughs> kind of, you know, that there's a message there, right? Like, to me, the whole conversation we were having yesterday about hope and optimism, what I focus on is being inspired and being inspired to do the work and to help motivate other people to be, to be in action, like to, to get involved and to engage and to... Um, not be in denial or avoidance and all, you know, cynicism, despair. So we're going to be talking about all those things. Then I'm going to read another poem that I wrote in 2003 uh, when I left the legislature. So I was there for 13 years. My first term, I was the environment critic for the opposition. And um, I wrote this about when I was the environment critic. Um, for two years, I was a guidance counselor at Tech Falk High School, and I had the honor of witnessing boys and girls turn into men and women right before my eyes as they would cry me their horror stories, childhood trauma, abuse, neglect, violence, racism, poverty, divorce. And I would believe them. The memory of the needle tracks and slash marks on their young arms are seared into my memory like cigarette burns like the cigarette burns. I did triage in a war against children. Who would believe it? I ran. And for 13 years elected as an MLA, I was had the honor of witnessing men and women turn into boys and girls right before my eyes as we acted out our horror stories as war children. Abuse of power, ego, fear, victim bully, never shed a tear. So... It's about when you're in politics, you're not supposed to be vulnerable. And really, that's what we need, hey? We need those people in politics. So I'm reading, I brought a few books that I'm reading too right now, including this one, Corruptible, Who Gets Power and How It Changes Us, which is about people in power. I just read a bit this morning about police and the ads to recruit police, how they're actually attracting people who are violent and abuse power. And how in New Zealand, they've done a whole campaign to try and attract different people, more women, more Maori people, to be in their police force by having a different recruitment process. So, um, yeah, I, I brought some books. So uh, let's try the slide share out. Oh, it's not working. Or the slide changer. It was working a minute ago. I wonder if it doesn't work. Be oh, there it goes. A little bit of delay. So this is what I've prepared for us today, is we're going to be talking a little bit about you now as an activist and your health and well-being and what motivates you and what is going to inspire uh, you to be in it for the long haul. So we're going to be talking a little bit about emotional well-being. Um, we're going to be talking about healthy, how to be a healthy activist. So I am a health teacher. I do a lot related to connecting health and health education, community development and politics. That's kind of my jam. That's kind of where I, the intersect, I work in the intersection of health education, community development and politics. So we're going to be doing uh, an activity looking at um, the, the, the domains of health. So the presentation that we had that was talking about the medicine wheel, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, we're going to do a little bit on trauma um, in theory. Um, we're not going to be talking about trauma, our, our own trauma, but we're going to be learning some models that help us understand what causes people to avoid and be disengaged and watch cat videos instead of learning about climate change when they're on social media. So I'm going to do a little bit of teaching. Um, I'm not sure why that seven is there. And um, I'm going to give you lots of resources. So there are some handouts. We're going to do a little bit, a little sample of, of meditation. 
So that sounds like a lot, but uh, we only have, um, we'll see if it's less than an hour. And yeah, this other book that I brought, we're talking about grit. So here's another book I picked up recently called Grit, The Power of Passion and Perseverance. And, you know, we if you, the, being a climate activist, as you know, is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> There's a lot more frustration and disappointment and lack of progress than there is than there are victories perhaps and sort of feeling like things are moving so building up our capacity for uh determination you know persistence we're going to be talking about that sound okay good use of an hour of your time so uh, let's do a little check-in did that work did it go one slide I, th I think it just went one slide so when you think about climate change, what's happening to the planet and what's not happening, how do you feel when you think about climate change? You can just kind of like what we did yesterday, shout it out, knowing that the main four main emotions are fear, anger, sadness, and being glad or joy, getting into joy. And I don't know how well that, well, it does show up pretty good on the big screen. So do we have a roving microphone? Oh, yeah. Does anyone want to be brave? And when you think about what's happening, what is someone, someone said frustrated. Okay. Someone in the chat said frustrated. Someone else in the chat said sadness and anger. Yeah. Reconsideration. You reconsideration. Reconsideration. That's not an emotion I've ever heard of. Can you explain that a little bit more? Thank you for the opportunity. So kind of a reflection, maybe. Reflective. Yeah. Okay, so thoughtful. You feel like maybe curious. Maybe is that that's kind of because those are though that is in your head, right? And emotions are in our body. So most of us probably like there's a there's a lot of anxiety right people are in despair and they're avoiding that by doing all sorts of things so i we're going to be talking about that uh mostly sad someone else wrote in the chat um some said hope uh, so ian said hope. regret 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 about that um could have done more or just regret that you know, I, I don't know, just regret and disappointment, I think. those are Because regret, regret also has some, maybe some guilt. Yeah. I know that yesterday people were talking about feeling like obligation. Right. So this wheel is helpful in sort of figuring out where you are um, on that. And this whole idea that there are primary emotions, like this happens to us all the time when we feel sad we often can actually don't cry. We actually get angry. Like the sadness is the primary emotion, but then we'll cover it up by being angry about what caused us to be sad or something like that. So that's, it's a little bit more complicated. It's not, oh, there it goes. Oop, now it went twice. Okay. So, oh boy. Okay, I, I think I have to be patient with this thing. Patience is a good emotion. Yeah. I can't click it too many times. Okay, I got to go back one more slide. There we go. So this is where I want it to be. Hopefully it doesn't change. Oh, it doesn't like that slide. No, I want to be one more back. Oh, it, so that's not the one that's showing on my screen. Okay, that's the delay. Thank you. Okay, so this is another um, looking looking at how emotions combine. So this is kind of, to me, a, a pretty lovely thing to understand that love is about joy and trust. And surprise and fear create alarm or even that crisis feeling. Uh, contempt is disgust and anger. So understanding 
that there's this sort of melding. So some of the things that people were saying can kind of help explain uh, what people are feeling, like this, it's this layering, right? Um, and what we want to be able to do and why I'm bringing this up is we want to start having a conversation about what are the converse, what are the emotions that actually motivate people to engage? And a lot of what has happened, if you think about it, in the climate justice movement, especially especially when we talk about focusing on the science, is it elicits what? Alarm? Fear? Like, do you think people, especially young people, when they realize and they start learning that there's not going to be species that are, you know, there's going to be all this species extinction, they learn that there's going to be all this uh, crisis, that, they're, that that it's scary. It's like hopelessness as well. Yes. And it's kind of paralyzing at times. So the idea that hopeless is that it's nothing, it seems to be changing, it's getting worse, but also like we've talked about all weekend, as individuals, we can't do much about it right? As individuals, we can ride our bicycles and eat vegetarian and, you know, do all these things. But we know that the systems have to change and systems change. That's why we just did a workshop on movement building and why we're doing this training, right? So um, to put it in that context, I'm going to the next slide. So this is again, I brought up, but it's a different visual of the stages of change. Um, and again, trying to apply this to understanding where people are coming from and where we are coming from ourselves, because we're all experiencing this too, in terms of the stages that people go through to get to action and to get to being able to um, have the kind of emotional response that leads you to being active and engaged and um, not avoiding or being cynical and uh, apathetic. And feeling powerless, really. That's the that's the issue. Okay, we can go to the next one. So this is the question is how as activists do we work with emotions? And um how do we want to feel ourselves in order for us to be healthy as activists? So when we know that people are feeling um like avoiding or sad or or powerless when they're confronted, how does that shape what we do as activists? How do we how do we be trauma informed activists? That's kind of what what uh, we're talking about. So I've done this whole. Uh, I have something that I call the politics of unity, which talks about bringing a trauma informed perspective to politics and activism, as well as conflict resolution kind of uh, skills and perspectives. So what feelings will motivate action, learning, curiosity, collaboration, determination, all those things that we need um, in order to do this work? Um, so how do we cultivate those feelings in the work that we're doing, not only for ourselves, but for other people? What do you think? Comments? Restate the question. How do we cultivate the feelings that are going to get people engaged and active and curious and learning into the work that we're doing? Yeah, that's... With a feeling of uh, positivity and uh, results, at least on a, a local level. Okay. That, that, that might, that, you know, you, you can see tangible tangible results from the work that they're part of. Yes, people want to see results. But when we're doing this kind of systems change work, when we're working, you know, I've, I've also written this thing about how, you know, we're on our bicycles and we're doing all this uh, work of trying to live our values and live more simply. And then we're up against corporations and governments that have big budgets for advertising and you know, spreading this information and all the things that have been happening. So it's like this David and Goliath thing, right? It's so how do we sort of bolster ourselves and other people in the face that of what we're we're up against? 
Uh, so this is the next slide. So this, oh, comment, go ahead, uh, Kurt. Well, uh, expressions of gratitude with other activists, like if you've got an, a community, don't be shy to share with, I appreciate what you're doing. I that what you did yesterday or what you did at that rally was great. Those kinds of expressions of of gratitude help e each other. Help yes, people. lifting people, people up lifting and each other up. supporting each other and showing appreciation. Yeah, I I think for myself, I've found like kind of enjoying the process more than the destination. Like sometimes, like, you know, what I'd be canvassing. I'm like, I'm not sure I'll live to see the world that I want to see, but I just enjoy the fight and the process of you know the actions that are take that i'm taking more than whether I'll, I'll win or lose kind of thing yeah and that's a really good point is focus on the journey and the process and the and that's one of the things about community development is it is both a process and an end product and applying those kind of approaches so that we're practicing what we want to see as the result. So I really like what you're saying. And I'll, I'll add to that, the Go element ahead. of community, because I think that's so important in activist spaces and in movements. If you like the people you're organizing with and you feel a sense of trust with them and community, then you're going to enjoy the process and you're going to yeah. be able to, to be in it uh, for the long haul together. Whereas if it's just like you don't have those personal relationships, it's just not the same. Uh, yeah, really good point. And that idea of being active is shown to help your mental health and having those connections yeah. and relationships help your mental health. So I know for me, what has been really important in addressing those feelings is to be involved in, in the movement or, you know, with, with various movements. And that is shown to be a positive response so that's one of the things that we can say to people, especially young people, if you are feeling anxious, then one of the ways to address that is to get involved with a group uh, who, have, who are trying to do something about it. So that's a very good way to be able to say, it's good for your mental health to be an activist, but you just have to make sure that it's with a balanced life, right? So that's what we're gonna do. So we can do a little bit of, um, settling in. And so I've interspersed in here a few samples of things. So especially if I, well, I'm going to show you a few things that are going to be um, uh, challenging. So let's do this first. So is everyone okay? I don't know. I haven't checked the chat lately. See if there's any other, no other comments in the chat. So just sit with your feet flat on the floor. So if you're facing me, you can turn your chair so that you're either facing the table or facing away. Um, and um, so feet flat on the floor is really important. So you're grounded, even though we're not on the ground floor. And um, it's if you don't feel comfortable closing your eyes, just look down. And we're just going to be breathing. And I'm going to suggest to you some things to say uh, to yourself while you're breathing. So you're taking very calm breaths through your nose in a relaxed way. And we're only gonna do five breaths on this. So this is on YouTube. It's a Thich Nhat Hanh meditation called Calm Ease. And um, let's try it. So as you breathe in, think to yourself, I'm breathing in. And as you breathe out, think to yourself, I'm breathing out. And we're gonna do that five times. Then just say, breathing in to yourself, breathing out. And now as you breathe in, say, as I breathe in, my breath is deep. As I breathe out, my breath is slow. So in is deep, out is slow.
the next breath in, say, I'm calming my mind and my body. And when you breathe out, say ease to yourself. Breathing in is calm. Breathing out is ease. When you breathe in, smile, actually smile with your face and think, I'm smiling at my challenges and difficulties. When you breathe out, say release my challenges and difficulties. In is smile, out is release. And the last one is as you breathe in, think I'm in the present moment. And as you breathe out, it's a wonderful moment. In is present moment, out is wonderful moment. Okay, so that was only a few minutes. In the material I've shared with Adrian and um, Hope, there's a link for uh, a YouTube where you can do that, and they do it for 15 or 30 minutes. There's different lengths of it. And I can guarantee you, if you put that in your day, you will be more calm. You'll be more productive and you'll be happier. <laughs> so I don't know how you feel right now. Do you feel a little bit more chill and relaxed just from doing that with, which was very, very few minutes. I don't know exactly how long. So that'll set us up to kind of carry on with this. So I just, okay. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what motivates you and why are you doing this work? So people can share, share in the chat in a few words. Um, and I've already talked about this idea of, um, I'm, I'm actually with uh, Greta Thunberg when she says she doesn't want people to hope because hope is kind of passive and it's about something happening in the future. And that's why it's about being inspired to act. Like she talked about, she wants people to act and to... Um, so, you know, that's kind of what we're what we're getting at is what is what motivates you? So people can shout out a few things. Put your hand up. The mic is walking around and you can put things in the chat. What motivates you to be doing this work as an activist, especially people that are doing this outside of their regular day job, just on your own time? Um, a lot of us do both. A lot of us work in in working for change both in our jobs and then we also are doing things in our on our um off time yeah i think what motivates me like so obviously i work for the climate reality project but i also run a climate book club oh and um it's honestly just really inspiring because i learned so much from other people because we read climate books and we're all working in different sectors so there's people in film people in like hard science there's people in engineering. And so it's really kind of a spectrum. And it also inspires some people to move into the climate movement. Like one person who was in my book club 
um, is now like quit his real estate job and is now trying to do climate stuff full time. Mm. And so, yeah, just like being inspired by others, but also empowering others to act. Yeah. So that's what really motivates you is, yeah. is it, as an activist and as a full time activist is inspiring other people. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. So it's, you know, that saying it's 10% inspire or in, it's 10% information and 90% inspiration that's what we're trying to do so anybody else i'm not seeing a lot going on where's my chat let me see i i guess what motivates me is uh being a parent but also just caring about other people i think we all deserve a better future and so it's really about your kids and the future they're going to have and caring about everyone yeah or not just your kids but kids in general yeah, I think you're touching on. I see that that too. I was. Yeah, I see what really, it really important. Um, I think like the if you go down the deep motivation is love for other people, for the people that are close to you, for people across the world, for the planet, for nature, for animals, for plants, for you know that love. And if you think about it and kind of deconstruct it, even like hatred, kind of comes from love at the base of it. Like you can't hate if you don't feel deeply in care about something in a sense like the opposite of love is kind of apathy and not hatred but anyway that's hey that's pretty profound <laughs> that's good that's good other people so some of the things in the chat are um what's motivating people is to make lives better for humans animals plants and and then knowing that doing anything in this space is on average far better than doing nothing it's making the world better. And I live in said world. Concerned that mostly the other species, uh, so concerned for other species, sad that we, uh, what we are doing to them. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I'm inspired by Greta Thunberg on um, looking at her at a young age. I was wondering what I was doing when I was at her age. Um, and then also seeing a lot of people doing winter biking kind of inspired me what our body can do. And we can bike long distance. We can dress lean layers and biking winter mm. is not a problem. Yeah. And those, I don't know about anybody else, but being physically active and understanding how we are a holistic being makes you feel free and powerful. Like I know when I'm riding a bike or doing even, you know, Running, especially if you're in good shape, it's really fun. <laughs> so it, it has that feeling aspect to it. Okay. Uh, someone else said it's a bit selfish too. I'm concerned for what will happen to me and to other people. Uh, hopeless about what won't change in my lifetime. The smoky summers. So, the, you know, the, the negative things can really be motivating, but to also be motivated by some of the things that you were like what you were talking about okay let's move on so we're going to do something that was kind of alluded to earlier as well with talking about storytelling and we're go going to use a model from this guy marshall gantz who is also really the guru of distributive organizing that i was talking about yesterday um and at the end, you're going to be able to have an option to either write your leadership story using this model, or you're going to do a little bit of a plan on this health wheel that I'm going to show you right away. So we're going to come back to being able to talk about your why and your change goals and why you're doing what you're doing and putting that into a narrative or a story that will be able to inspire other people. And as leaders, as activists, you need to be able to, to share your own experience and why you're doing what you're doing is a way to inspire other people. So we'll talk about that. We're going to come back to that. So the next slide. So this is, um, you know, being a health teacher, I like stuff like this. <laughs> this is like so speaks to me. And the brilliance and beauty of the, the medicine wheel, which is used in different ways in indigenous cultures all over the world. So I didn't bring with me this book I have. It's on the list that I gave. 
for the reading list. It's called Recreating the World, and it talks about the use of this wheel. So I was introduced to this one by an elder when I worked at the Social Planning Council in around 2012, and we used it to write the poverty report card on Indigenous poverty. And what's really unique about this wheel is it doesn't just talk about us as individuals, which is in the middle, talking about our body, our mind, our spirit, and our heart or emotions, but it, but it helps us look at that at the community level or that middle section, and then takes it into the systemic. So the work that I do now, I started off, you know, focused on individual health and wellness, you know, but now I'm really interested in healthy communities and healthy systems and healthy organizations. And this wheel really helps explain how the community is the bridge between individuals and changing those systems. So building our communities, our movements is what is going to allow us to change those systems that are working against the, the kind of sustainability and harmony and, uh, and, and ecology that's healthy. So um, that, that kind of explains what this wheel is all about. So the, the mental goes to our knowledge, our education, our policy, political policy, and then the spirit goes into culture, what, what our values and our belief systems, who we are, are, our ways of being. And then the emotional goes into social, social support, how we relate to each other. Are, are we using abuse and conflict or can we relate as in an equitable and harmonious way, um, practice conflict resolution skills? And then of course the physical is the physical you know, the the economic and the environment, the natural world, and, and making that be more of a sustainable, integrated approach. So um, I rely on this a lot. And I've developed all sorts of ways of mapping assets in communities using this and other, other tools as well. So we're going to use this in talking about ourselves and the activism we do in a healthy way. So... When I was teaching health education at the University of Winnipeg, I was also working with mostly Indigenous women at a women's centre in downtown Winnipeg in the inner city. And I was saying, well, how do, I, how do I get people to understand holistic health? And how do I get people to understand social determinants of health in healthy communities? And this is what I came up with. It's asking three questions. What's a healthy person like? What do we need in our communities to be healthy? And then how do we get those things in our community? And I've built, we've, we can do a whole budget on that. Can you imagine if we did public budgets using those questions? So what we're going to be talking about is that is getting you to think about what is a healthy activist like? So we're going to be talking about that in these four domains, healthy mentally, which in this, in this case is cognitive health. So your mind, not so much psychology, so the, the psychology is more around the feelings and the emotions. So what's healthy emotions like, a healthy body, and a healthy spirit. So I'm going to go through this kind of quick, because um, this is a lot of content. So the next slide. And when I, when I was doing this in my classes, I actually would have students generate this as they would answer the question, what's a healthy person like? I've kind of flipped it today, and I'm going to go show you some of the answers, and then we're going to have a chance to discuss how that applies to activism, being, a, being an activist. So this is what we're, we're going to be looking at. So, and these are just kind of very beginning offerings. Um, so how many of you have heard of emotional literacy? Okay, you know what that is, being able to know what you're feeling, identify what you're feeling, communicate what you're feeling. Okay, that's good. How many of you heard of emotional intelligence? Yay. Okay. So being able to, that gets into more being able to have some social skills, regulate, to motivate yourself, and uh, be able to be compassionate and empathetic to other people. Like this is what healthy people are like, right? Okay. And then in terms of your, your mind, how, how many teachers in the room have seen this before? This is like essential to understanding how people learn and how people develop their 
mental capacities to learn. So the basic skills, mental skills or cognitive skills are to remember, then to understand, and then to apply what you're learning and remembering, and then to analyze, evaluate, and the most complex or most advanced thinking skill is what? Creativity. So being able to then know all this stuff and innovate and create something new to imagine, to be, um, uh, to think outside the box. That's the, and then understanding that there are all these different types. If you think about what your mind can do, like all, all the different ways that you can think and what we want to be able to do is employ all of those ways of thinking. So healthy minds are like pretty amazing that we have this brain in our head that can do all these things. So we can think of how we use all these different types of thinking in the work that we do as activists. And then the next slide, here it comes. So this is from a website I just love called School of Thought. And it lists thought distortions and cognitive biases. And there's two slides, like, oh, people are putting stuff in the chat. Uh, no, I'm okay. Um, so you've all heard of people having um, implicit bias, right? We talked about worldviews yesterday. Like a lot of that is based on assumptions, uh, you know, unconscious bias is what we're talking about. And then these thought distortions that we often use when we're debating or arguing with someone to try and prove that we're right. And it's they're kind of manipulative. And what we can do, and some of the work that I'm doing and trying to apply conflict resolution, is we can create agreements in our groups not to do these things, not to use these on each other in our activist groups. So, I mean, you know, we don't have time to talk about what these are, but I encourage you to go to this website, School of Thought, um, and to learn more about these biases. Oh, I have to plug in my, to hear a plug. All right, so who's who have looked at thought distortions and cognitive bias before? Yeah? Do you tr think of applying that in the work that you're doing around climate? I mean, there's so much with the misinformation out there that fits with all of these different techniques. So this is another, this is getting into this spiritual health. And you were really getting into talking about this. I don't know your name. Surely, surely. So this idea that, um, you know, we want to be working in those higher levels of uh, being, ways of being. So this is the Hawkins scale. And then because I was teaching holistic health, um, uh, this is types of courage, so we need a lot of courage. And there should be one more slide about, oh, ah, that one is not, okay. Um, the slide that I was looking for, um, there, there's a book I used when I was teaching in the public school system and in, you know, I'm in a secular organization, education institution, talking about spiritual well-being. So it can't be about religion, right? It has to be about spirituality. So there, there, if this is missing a slide which talks about um, the that's that spirituality is about connection. It's about connecting to nature in particular, as well as other people, our own ancestry and lineage, and you know, different different um, types of courage. I'm going to okay, the next slide. So then the next one is physical, our physical well-being. No, it's not changing. There it goes. Oh, see, I'm not being patient. <laughs> okay, that's how it works. Okay, this is the one I want to be on. This is the next one. So then, of course, this is what most people think about is health, right? It's like the healthy body. So this is the very basic of, 
you know, taking care of yourself as an activist is getting some physical activity. And this morning, the reason I didn't come is I went to my, my workout because if I don't work out, I get a little squirrely <laughs> and then eating well and quality sleep. So that's what most people learn about, but look at this next slide because what we are really is all these systems, right? All of these are part of our body. And to be able to think about how a lot of us, because of our family lineage and genetics, we have predisposition to when we're stressed that certain body systems are going to take it. And they're going to, um, I know with myself, it's my endocrine system, my hormones. That's, that's my sort of weak link. Other people, it could be their heart and their circulatory system. So it's really important to know yourself and your history, your family history, so that you know when there's signs that you're under a lot of uh, stress and how it's going to show up for you in your body, in your systems, in your ability to sleep, in your feeling you know, down and depressed, wherever it's going to show up. So those are, um, that's the end of the health teacher part. So I wanted to have a chance for you. This is where we're going to do a bit of, um, let me just go to the next. Can you go to the next one, please, Hope? Yeah. So go. So this is where I was going to give you a chance. The, the, the one previous is, yeah, this is the one I want to be on. So if you can, um, this is where I wanted you to be able to have a little bit of a conversation. Uh, so if you're at a table where there's at least two other people, would be good. And um to talk about your, you know, for yourself, from what we've just looked at, what of these areas do you really need to pay attention to? And um, what are the areas where, uh, you know, we're going to talk in a minute about some of the things that you can do in these, th these different areas of health and well-being. So then you can apply this a little bit more. You can think about some of the groups that you're involved with and how to bring this into those groups so that people kind of like what was said earlier about supporting each other um, and lifting each other up. So how to incorporate taking, taking care of ourselves as activists into the groups that we're working in. So a lot of times that might be in the relationship area so, you know, people, for example, can have walking meetings, so they're getting exercise. I do that with a few people. Okay, so we're going to try and finish in about 15 minutes, so I'm going to continue on, and we're, I'm going to show you at the end, we're going to come back to that. And so this, this is the more complex. <laughs> so this is a model of explaining uh, determinants of health that and how, how many of you have studied determinants of health social determinants of health so so this idea that what makes us healthy isn't just up to us it's about the environment we live in obviously in the physical environment we need clean air water soil to grow healthy food and we need to be not to be in toxic relationships you know exposed to toxic media um those kinds of things and then the big thing is, go to the next slide. Um, what a lot of people don't understand is that relationship between our ability to make healthy choices and the environment that we're in. So those social determinants of health really are what are influencing our health. So if we're in a toxic workplace where there's unhealthy relationships or, um, you know, that kind of... Uh, that it's very hard for us to be feel safe and be healthy in those in those situations and do good work. So then the next slide is even uh, this is a really good video to watch about determinants of health. So this is kind of a model of explaining determinants of health. Go to the next slide. I'm gonna skip that one. Kind of already talked about that. Okay, so I was gonna take a break and talk a little about what we're how you're doing so far. This is uh, the the bridge in the park, by the way. 
that sunset is Assiniboine Park Bridge. Let's keep going. So now we're going to be talking a little bit about if climate is causing trauma. I think the answer is yes. And what are the trauma responses to the crisis? So this is a little diagram that summarizes what's happening. And people get overwhelmed. What do we think? Is that going to go to the next slide? Oh, one back. So this is... A lot. Um, this is again a little bit of theory of what happens when people experience trauma, and I'm always amazed that a lot of people they don't know this. So this is like you know emotional well-being 101. So when you have something happen to you that is traumatic, you're in that first column. You have an experience, and you have a feeling. And if that feeling is not expressed. If you're feeling powerless or angry or afraid, and it gets it gets pushed down into our into our bodies, into those systems we were looking at earlier, and then you start developing coping habits for how to cope with that, and a lot of that becomes compulsive behavior, can lead to addictions and patterns that then get repeated. So, you know, common example is if a if a kid falls and hurts themselves, they're riding their bicycle, they fall and they hurt themselves, and they're told, you know, don't cry, be a big boy, big boys don't cry. That whole idea that you can express sadness or hurt gets suppressed. Toxic masculinity it leads to toxic masculinity. And all these behavior patterns of, of you know, I won't go into now, but it's, and important that we understand that this is what's then happening to people when they're experiencing the news, which is talking about all the disasters happening because of climate and war and all everything else. So my big point here, if we go to the next slide, is that we're experiencing trauma, not just because of things that happen to us per personally, but we're experiencing trauma because we live in oppressive structures. And that's, you know, the systems work that we are going to be, um, that, that's why we're talking so much about movements and, and systems change. So there's a whole thing that we could talk about in terms of internalized, uh, internalizing oppression, which is another focus of the work that I do, is helping people understand how they've internalized racism, how they've internalized things from colonialism, from patriarchy, and we're not going to do that today, but there is uh, a little handout in the materials that is like a little self-inventory about internalized uh, oppression, particularly around the economy and capitalism. So I won't belabor that anymore. This is another part I think that's important for us to understand because climate is causing so much trauma is this concept of a window of tolerance. And this is from polyvagal theory. So I'm just going to go to that next slide. So how many of you, when you are stressed, get more into kind of fight and flight? You want to do something, you, you want to run away, or you want to do some fight, prove you're right. So that's the hyperarousal. And then how many of you when things are really stressful, you tend to retreat and you tend to withdraw and kind of shut down, want time alone. So how many of you are more like that? So this concept is really helpful because what we want to be able to do is understand that we need to be in that moderated level window of tolerance where our, we feel calm like you did after you did that little short meditation. So the whole goal of, you know, when we're activists and when we're, we're trying to be healthy is to, to, re, to reduce our reactivity, to reduce our uh, being sort of triggered or getting really angry or getting really sad or, um, you know, that fight and flight response. So I find this concept really helpful. So that I'm aware of when I'm being moved out of that middle part. So let's go to the next slide. 
I'm going to just skip over this. This is uh, understanding then what triggers us to move out of that uh, regulated state. And this woman, um, Dr. Toomey, oh, one back. There we yeah, this, so these are, and you see this all the time in meetings, in activist groups, in any, you know, at work meetings, how people get triggered. So I really appreciate this work that really helps us understand what triggers us. And I know for myself, what triggers me is exclusion. When I'm feeling excluded, I'm feeling like that then I'm going to be more reactive. So for different people, there's going to be different it may be more when your competence or your integrity is questioned. Um, so let's go to the next slide. I've got five minutes. This is levels of empowerment, understanding um, how people move from feeling powerless and maybe depressed to being more empowered and being prepared to be active and engaged. Going really to the next slide. Oh, one, yeah, this one. So we've talked a lot about hope and apathy and cynicism. So this is a, a, a slide that helps explain when people try to get involved in things and they don't have any uh, sort of way of engaging well, then they start getting cynical and feeling like nothing can change and being apathetic. And the next slide, I'll skip over that one. That's, this is... Also dealing with frustration, disappointment. Let's go to the last last few slides. So, you know, I, I read a lot. How many of you read a lot? I just read because I find it helps me cope with, so I read lots of books like this one I brought, I just got at Prairie Sky. It's uh, Essential Readings on Engaged Buddhism, True Peace Work. Um, and it's got a lot of the people that are in the list that I gave to you. So this is another book I just started reading recently. And the next slide. So we were gonna take another breath or breather. Um, so, cause I'm gonna just show you the last activities and all of this material is in the handout. So you're gonna be able to do it on your own time. So I'll just show you what um, I had in mind uh, for you to do. So the, Two activities. One, I was going to suggest if people are really struggling with confidence, then doing the story of your leadership and why you're engaged. And then if you're feeling more overwhelmed, you're angry, you're feeling discouraged, then spending a bit more time working with that wheel and figuring out some things that you can do every day, every week and every month that are going to take care of your four domains of health. So I've put together, um, you know, this, this kind of direct guidance to be able to make that commitment to yourself. And uh, you, one of the things that you can do is even just as we're ending, tell someone at your table, which of these two you're going to do, because when you tell someone you're going to do something, you're more likely to do it. So um that's i think that we can end on that note so this is uh i was going to explain this a bit more but there is a handout in the package that you can read and i'll just go to the last slides hope so we were going to do a little bit of sharing but we'll skip over that part and let's just do a quick check out I'm sure a lot of you are hungry and feeling uh, like it's been a long weekend, but just share. So from the presentation, how are you feeling now? Thumbs up. Okay. Couple empowered. Thumbs up. A little bit empowered. Excited to do more. Okay. Did anyone else want to share? Anybody else in the chat? Okay, so I did kind of fly through the last bit. And the last slide I think is just, oh yeah, so the resources I, are on the on, on the shared drive or however that's being shared. And um, I love this phrase as applying it to climate. 
is don't agonize, organize. So kind of putting together what I presented yesterday about community organizing and movement building with this taking care of ourselves. So I would encourage you to search Florence Kennedy, who, you know, is an American kick-ass uh, activist who coined this phrase, don't agonize, organize. That's where it comes from. So um, hopefully you can tell someone at your table which of those two you're going to do. Are you going to do your story of leadership or are you going to do the health wheel? And once you make that commitment, we can call it call it a day.